Hello everyone. I am back in a new location. I decided to try out this. I think the lighting is a little different, but I won't always be filming in this location. I just have the opportunity to do so. So I am back to review the newest album by Florence and the Machine titled High as Hope. It was released this Friday, today, June 29th, 2018. It is her fourth studio album. And it comes three years after her last studio album, How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful, out in 2015. I have reviewed all of her records on this channel, so please check them out. I'll be linked in the description if you're curious. Any Florence fans out there, if you're not familiar, I love Florence's music. I have great things to say about all of her records, particularly ceremonials and How Big, How Blue. So coming into Highest Hope, it suffice to say that I have very high expectations. In fact, my expectations may have been a little bit too high, and that's not Florence's fault. She is an artist that I am deeply fascinated with her persona and her aesthetic, the imagery surrounding her art. There's something very visceral about her performances, her choreography, her poetry. She has a book of poems that is coming out next week that is her first published book, um, and I'm very interested to get my hands on that, so I may review that if I ever do. This is a shorter album. It's only 10 songs. Her other albums were a lot longer, especially Ceremonials, which, uh, which at first I was a little bit dismayed about because I think that, you know, 10 songs can be a little short for a record. But then I was like, no, we've got other artists who are making albums with, you know, 20 plus songs. We know who we're talking about here. And you look at that track list and you're about to faint and you're like, I just don't have time for this. And you're like, you know what, 10 songs is nice. I like albums that are short and sweet because you know each song was handpicked, was cherry-picked to be there for a reason. There's no fillers. And to be fair, I do believe that almost every single song on this record definitely deserves to be on there, and it is something I would come back to and listen to again. There's only one song that I feel a little let down by, which is unfortunate because it's the opening track, but I still love it. There's still something about this body of work that feels very cohesive. The album feels very much like it belongs together, which is something that maybe her other albums felt a tiny bit more scattered because they were a lot longer. How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful did feel like it was going in a lot of different directions at different points. And this is something that this album, partly because it's so condensed, but also because there's a clearer focus, I think, in terms of what she's singing about. This album is a lot more grounded in her own real life. There's a lot more direct conversations with people that she knows her family members. She has a song dedicated to one of her favorite musicians, Patti Smith, on the song Patricia. She talks about living in New York, talks about relationships even more candidly than she's done in the past. And she talks about, more importantly, growing up and the misgivings, but also the nostalgia that she has about her drinking-filled life, uh, teenage years in Camberwell, South London, in the song South London Forever. Gone are, in this record, some of the very sweeping emotional landscapes that her previous records conjured up. This record is a lot more sparse, it's a lot more minimalistic, it's a lot more focused on that beautiful pining vocal of hers and how she can turn a note and do so many interesting things with it. There's often just a bit of percussion in the background, some what sounds like a tambourine, some bells, some keyboard work. There's some very jazzy and blues influences. She has uh, Kamasi Washington playing a lot of the instrumentation on some of this record, and I can hear that influence for sure. Um, she has definitely a bit of a bluegrass feel almost in some songs, and that live instrumentation, live performance feeling is not something that has been completely divorced from your music before, but it feels extra focused in on on this record in particular. And it is something that gives it a very down to earth and raw and close to the microphone feel. It's an intimate look into Florence herself, not Florence and the machine, this enigmatic, metaphorically clothed, you know, nymph running through the forest. Uh, talking about love and life in such existential terms. This album has bits of that, but this album is a lot more uh, personal. And, you know, be that as it may, it may not be my favorite record because of that. Um, there is just something showy and beautiful about the sweeping, you know, emotionally filled powerhouse songs of, you know, from her previous records that maybe this album is lacking to some extent. Um, you can definitely dance to this record. It's not all slow songs, which was something I was kind of wondering. But Hunger, the lead single, definitely is get up on your feet, have a really good time, do a lot more of a simplistically produced, but very much at the same time well-crafted 
pop song. She considers it a pop song, even though this is all considered alternative. Anyway, I, I could go on and on about summarizing the basic vibe and aesthetic of this record, but overall, it's a very laid-back record. I think it's one that is much better suited to just sort of sitting and being reflective and calm. It's an album that definitely lives in those quiet coffee shops in South London or in Soho in New York. It's a little bit hipster, which is not something that's that surprising. It's an alternative indie rock record. What do you expect? Um, and it's got an art house vibe to it, and it definitely is a little bit less of a record that I would necessarily listen to like while running or even while driving to some extent. This record just is so well suited to a sunny afternoon with a good cup of coffee and your favorite book. Honestly, it feels like Florence just relaxing a lot more and being, like I said, so much more open with us. The opening track, June, is a very earnest and very direct song, and it's very sparse until it all comes in at once in a very almost deafening cacophony. And I use that term partly in a negative way because there are some aspects of this song, especially how it jumps from verse to chorus that are a little bit jarring, and it is unpredictable, and I'm okay with that. This song doesn't necessarily sit with me as well as others on this record, or as I expected it to being an album opener. Um, it definitely starts out reflective and soft. She says the show is over. You get this idea of being behind closed doors with her right from the beginning. Um, just from the very first instrumental, there's this breath, there's this space in this song, and she delivers it very deliberately and slowly to get across what she is trying to talk about. Overall, the song is a little bit middle of the road for me. I, there's not a single song of hers that I don't like, but this is definitely my least favorite song on this record, just because it's not a lyrical fault whatsoever. It's all instrumentation, all in terms of the song structure. She has talked about in interviews how this album, she wanted to be a little bit more freeform and carefree in terms of how she constructed songs, not being so worried about choruses and different, you know, chord structures. And you can hear that in this song. This song feels very much like an artist in, you know, in a split second conjuring up a melody without much thought to uh, repetition or getting it exactly right in their head. Um, and it definitely has that raw emotional vulnerability. And so I give it props for that, but it definitely stands against the rest of the album a little bit below some of the other more uh, immediately grabbing songs on this record. We have the second track, Hunger, which I have made a review about and talked about on um, this channel, so I'll link that, that in the description. Um, all, again, she talks about bearing her soul in a way she'd never thought to before in any sort of song. Starting out at 17, I started to starve myself. A lyric that hit a lot of us by surprise, and even her own friends and family, they were like, how are you going to put this in a pop song when you've never even talked about this to us for years? She did really believe that putting it out there in a song was her way of dealing with it, and, you know, she didn't have to prelude it, she didn't have to explain it. It was just out there, a reference to an eating disorder that she had at that age which is something a lot of girls can relate to, or guys can relate to as a young child anyway. It doesn't necessarily mean, you know, she was hospitalized because of it, and it's this big drama thing. Um, so Hunger, it's bouncy, it's playful. It definitely uh, is a good mix of everything that's great about Florence's music, and it's a standout single because of it. I haven't been able to get it out of my head for the last few weeks, and it has some beautiful, really punching lyrics, like, how could anything bad ever happen to you? You make a fool of death with your beauty, and for a moment I forget to worry. These are the kinds of lyrics that I come to Florence for, because only Florence can pen them. They are so raw, personal, relatable, and so poetically composed, without being like over the top and pretentious, that really get you thinking, and also really just tug on the heartstrings, like saying, same, same, I feel this way so much. South London forever. This is a much more autobiographical track, as I said, and this song plays a lot like a bicycle ride, as she talked about bicycling in her uh, hometown of Camberwell in South London. Um, she talks about all these locations and familiar haunts that she uh, would frequent, like the Joiner's Arms, a pub in that, in that town that she grew up in, or how afterwards she could never find her way back to a mother's house. Um, I love the illusion of little kids, well, not really kids, teenagers, uh, stumbling from the bar, drunk, 
like little foals, newborn foals stumbling upon their feet. The way she delivers this song is very soft and sweet and reflective. Um, it's definitely not a belter for her, which is something that we're not accustomed to. We're accustomed to her being very like, I'm going to, you know, belt my lungs out in some crazy growly vocal performance. Um, this song definitely feels very, very easy going and carefree, like it's taking its time to get where it needs to go. Um, and it delivers, you know, the ending metaphor of everything I did it was just a way to scream your name, which means, which reads on so many levels, like obviously a love song, but also, you know, this reflective understanding of uh, being in love with life and not changing anything. You know, she may look back and think, oh gosh, I can't believe I was that, that wild and crazy in my youth. But you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. This was me screaming my love for life at the time the way I needed to do it. And I'm glad I've calmed down now and I'm glad I don't drink so much. Um, but I definitely, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit blinded by the light. The light's coming out from behind Florence's album cover, which I think is pretty fitting, honestly. So it's gonna be like that until the sun moves. Um, but ultimately, I find this song to just get you in a state of mind. It makes you feel and remember experiences that you've had in your own hometown. Big God. Oh boy. Now this is the one really ominous direct song on this record. Direct in that it's like not beating around the bush in terms of the, the sort of anger that's built up and the bitterness that his song imbues. And it's something we need because this record needs a little bit of that polarity. This song almost feels like it doesn't fit on the record, being so dark, contrasting a much lighter and more re relaxed, you know, summer evening ambiance. But it fits at the same time. Um, this is, I think, the one song on the record, along with 100 Years, that actually I really do feel like is propelling the narrative of Florence's music. Otherwise, this record would feel very much like possibly the closing credits music of the film of Florence's life. There's so much reflection to, you know, times in her youth, which she still is young. She's only 31 years old, or she's turning 32 this year, I believe. But, you know, songs like Big God and 100 Years are nice because, yes, they do bring back the religious mythological imagery and metaphor, which is something we always love Florence for. But they kind of propel, there's still, there's still something rumbling beneath her that needs to get out. There's an itch that hasn't been scratched yet. And these songs are not resolutions in themselves. Um, they're just uh, precursors to more to, for more to come, because obviously she's going to release more music. And even though a lot of the other songs on this record may feel a little bit like swan songs, even though Florence has never stated this is her last record, she may take a bit of a break after it. But um, there's definitely something that, I don't know, I just had to mention that because it, it definitely is, <laughs> it's, it's something that would fit very much more on her other records. And that's why I'm getting that energy mixed in with a lot of this sort of, all right, I'm going to sit down and recount like specific instances of my life and write songs about them instead of continuing this, you know, poetic exploration of existential struggles. I've talked about how Big God is all at once about God and the universe and love and at the same time about how she just was not getting a text back from someone she was interested in. Something we can all relate to. That throat growl at the end, that demonic cackle that sounds very much like something from the Grudge films where a demonic, a demonic exorcism is so fitting and so beautiful and I was spellbound when I heard it in the first recording of it because I was not expecting it whatsoever. And at once it made sense. I was like, I'm glad Florence put that in there. I don't think it's too strange. I don't think it stands out too much from the rest of the song or the album for that matter, because it does carry a darkness that is still bubbling beneath her. You know, there's things that have yet to be said. There are, you know, uh, <laughs> battles yet to be fought. And that's what this kind of music is pointing towards. We contrast that a lot with the next song, Sky Full of Song, which I've also talked about. This was technically the first song released, even though it's not official single. This song is a domestic song, in my view. This song, maybe because of the orchestration, feels very quiet, like someone cleaning a house and watering plants in a beautiful little cottage on a sunny day with the sun streaming in. There are moments in the instrumentation where these breaths, the instrumentation just swells so beautifully. And I get that feeling of someone who's much more content with life. 
uh, but it's also unloading a frustration or a depression that or a melancholy that has fallen upon them because as much as this song may sound content um, it's also very melancholy hold me down I'm so tired now leave me where I lie grab my ankles I've been flying for too long oh hold me back from from losing myself and allow me to be grounded because that is where I I'm most connected to my roots, to my family, to everything, to life. And it is important to stay grounded. It's important to know of your roots. It's important. This song definitely feels like a flower trying to, to grasp its roots more firmly in the soil while looking upwards, as this song is constantly reminding you to do, aim your arrow at the sky higher. The beautiful melodies, instrumentations, the harmonies, it's a beautiful song. Very well polished, very min minimalist, and a very good taste of what this album was to be. It was a great song to release as the first official, you know, preview of this record. We move on to the very schmaltzy, beautiful piano ballad, Grace. This song is a dedication to her younger sister, talking about how she hasn't always been the best older sister for her in the past. Um, she references specifically her sister's 18th birthday. Um, she doesn't go into much more detail than that by just describing the settings, and then she uses metaphors like the sun hit my face and I started acting strangely, and there were mermaids everywhere. She uses some very surrealistic conjuring up of the situation to kind of to like some, add some anonymity because we don't want to know everything. It feels like this song is definitely like these two people airing out a grievance. This is an apology letter to her sister that her sister probably felt like she didn't deserve. She's, I mean, to be fair, if I were Grace and I heard Florence Welch, you know, pen this beautiful piano ballad for me, I would just be like, girl, what did I really, what did you do to me? Like you, of course we're siblings. We're going to fight, you know, we're going to have some rocks in our relationship, but you know, I'm, I'm flattered that you love me so much, but you didn't have to write it in a song, you know? But at the same time, I would be so touched. This song is so touching. Um, the way she gets right into the chorus was very unexpected for me. I was not expecting it to go from such a low key, uh, chilled out, relaxing, beautiful, elegant melody to being so cutting and loud with lots of vocal layering from her to create a choral effect, but it works. It's definitely something I would prefer. I do prefer the way the verses sound. It's so jazzy and it's so, um, it's almost cinematic. And I get a lot of like Sarah Bareilles inspirations on some of the songs on this record. And this is one of the songs where I hear Sarah Bareilles in there or I hear almost like a show tune production, something almost very theatrical and also very, very glamour, very Hollywood glamour about this song. It is very elegant and graceful. We have Patricia. Now I'd heard this song performed live and I've heard a lot of people say that Patricia actually sounds better live. And I can understand Patricia sounded really beautiful live when she did the harp instrumentation for it. And it was what I think a little bit of a slower tempo than the one we get on the studio uh, version, which is actually a lot faster than I was expecting. This song is not a ballad. This is one of the danciest records on this uh, album. And I actually really love it. I think it carries that jubilant, exultant, like, celebrate life earnestly attitude that other songs of hers that have had in the past like spectrum it reminds me a lot of spectrum um and also songs like dog days are over it feels very jubilant and i mean she's talking about patty smith a woman who she has said is such an inspiration for her not just musically but in the way she chooses to live her life in the moment in the reality that we have and celebrating all that's around her you know, she's not caught up in any sort of Hollywood facade. She is just purely enjoying every moment of her life and all the little simple things. And that wonderment um, is so contagious to Florence. And I can definitely understand why. Um, and I'm sure Patti Smith is over the moon that someone has penned a song to her so beautifully. Um, and again, I can only imagine what it must feel like to have someone write a song about you like this. That is just, especially Florence, because she can really craft a tune. Um, it's very sweet, you know, it's cute, but it's not saccharine. Um, there's parts in this record where I was worried it would go that direction. And I don't think she ever gets too saccharine or too mushy, um, for mushy sake, if that's a good way of putting that. Uh, then we have 100 Years. This is the epic 
uh, probably the most epic song. This is that shout it from the mountaintops or shout it from the cliffs moment because we always need that on a Florence record. We need a song that we can pound our chest to and, and be this pagan, like, ritualistic witch um, with a bit more of a gritty undertone. And that's what this song is. She incorporates a style that sounds very similar to a song uh, off of Ceremonials called Lover to Lover. Um, and it definitely feels like a sister song in that regard. This song would have fit beautifully on Ceremonials, also in terms of the lyrical content. Um, I love the lyric, I believe in love and the darker it gets, the more I do. I love that lyric. So true, isn't it? Lord, don't let me break this. Let me hold it tightly. Give me arms to pray with instead of ones that hold too tightly. There's a religious uh, existential calling for this song and also a universalist one because she's singing about how we all raise our voices and let our hearts take flight. The youth bleeding in the square and women raged as old men fumbled and cried. And then it's just too much. The streets, they will run with blood. A hundred arms, a hundred years. You can always find me here. See, this is the exact kind of abstract poetic uh balladry that we've come to expect from Florence. It's not easily accessible in terms of its meaning, as there are references and allegories to lots of different things scattered throughout, making it just sound like a very existential, heart-rendering soul cry. That's no other way better to describe it. It's a beautiful song, and it definitely gets the blood pumping in a good way. My favorite song on this record is The Most Bittersweet, The End of Love. The title in itself, I think, speaks volumes about the, the melancholy that this song carries. She talks about how she actually wanted to name the album this, but you know, if you name something the end of love, it sounds very dark and depressing, and she didn't necessarily view it as a depressing thing. To her, the end of love meant the end of searching endlessly for something that was outside of her. Um, it was finally finding that peace within. And it is a little bit hard to understand that because it sounds like a very negative thing but she decided ultimately it wasn't going to be a good title for the album. But the song is so, it's such a moment. And it's such a, it's a, you know, tears will definitely come to your eyes upon listening because it is just so arresting. The way she delivers it, the simplicity of the melody. Um, I feel nervous in a way that can't be named. I dreamt last night of a sign that read the end of love. And I remember thinking, even in my dreaming, it was a good line for a song talking about how the idea came to her in a dream. We're a family pulled from a flood. You tore the floorboards up and let the river rush in, not wash away. We were reaching in the dark that summer in New York, and it was so far to fall, but it didn't hurt at all. She talks about her grandmother when she sings, and in a moment of joy I in fury, I threw myself from the balcony, like my grandmother so many years before me. I've always been in love with you. Could you tell it from the moment that I met you? The way she sings this will just literally, it's like holding your heart in her hands and she's just, she's just toying with it. It's so emotionally affecting and ultimately, uh, well, cathartic in some ways for her to sing about um, the end of this sort of endless chase for love and all the things that she has done, you know, alluding to falling off of such a great height of a balcony. Um, and that was what love was, but it, didn't hurt at all um, to fall into your arms. There, you know, there are aspects of it that feel a little rom com especially when she sings that summer in New York. You're like, oh, I can see it now, that beautiful summer we had together. There's a lot of Sarah Bareilles in this song. If anyone has is familiar with her album, The Blessed Unrest, this song makes me think of that album so much, sonically and lyrically. It is just a direct nod to an album that was also what I felt like very hipster New York wrote love story. And this is just another continuation of that. This song was written um, when there was actually some family drama in New York while she was touring for How Big, How Blue, How Beautiful. I actually saw her perform live in New York in 2016, which makes me think, oh my God, this was the moment this song was being conceived. It's kind of crazy to think about. Um, and she talks about how, again, this maybe is not necessarily dramatically about romantic love. Um, but about a ending of some sort of lack um, of something else that she was constantly searching for. And so this song is, is pulling from a lot of sort of dramatic realizations that she was having at this point. And it goes back to the idea of the song Hunger as well, which is all about that lack.
that we feel we have by needing someone else. And, you know, the idea of just patching it up with, with a relationship here and there and, and searching for the, the, the panacea in other people when it was ultimately not, you know, the ultimate root or cure for your whatever ails you. It's what's inside of you. Can, can you bring you peace, ultimately? The final song, No Choir, is a beautiful a cappella short track. Um, it starts out a cappella, builds to a beautiful choral melody where she has her voice chorally uh, added around. Um, and it ends in a beautiful, lazy, la-di-da type manner, which I found so beautiful, so summery, and so uh, carefree. And this song speaks about how in life, there's often moments where there is no choir, no grand piano, no no beautiful ballad to come in to sing about a moment that is just pure peace and contentment. Um, and dealing with the balance between, you know, touring, which is so high octane in her life, and, you know, being at home and just reading a book and being content, you know, in quiet. Reconciling these two extremes in her life, which would be pretty challenging for an introvert, I can imagine, um, when you're, you know, touring in a huge festival city thing, and then you're one minute like there and then the next in your hotel room by yourself. And it's hard to write about being happy because the older I get, I find that happiness is an extremely uneventful subject. And there will be no grand choirs to sing, no chorus could come in, about two people sitting doing nothing. It kind of is pointing at what is the real goal of life? What is happiness? Is there always going to be some sort of struggle? Do we need struggle? I think this philosophically touches on some, uh, you know, interesting, uh, is life meant to be chaos? Um, sort of questions, which I think is really interesting to just sort of let the album sit on at the end. It opens that up into a big, broad context. Ultimately, life is about the little things, and that's what this record is is pointing at, you know? Like I said, this record is low-key. Um, even though there are moments where she belts and where she dances, this record is ultimately very reflective, very shimmery, very soft, and very sparse. And it's ultimately one that I think is quite rewarding. I think it's nice that it's short and succinct. And otherwise, I think some of these songs might drag on a little bit if she kept filling an album with songs like these. Um, and I do love just the honest, down-to-earth, vulnerable, girl-next-door appeal that this album has from her. And the way she is maturing in front of us in such an open way. Um, through her music and exploring that and, and not being afraid to air out her demons in music is something we all should do as artists. And it's, it's humbling to see because it helps, it helps you in your own life understand, you know, uh, how to reconcile things you might have done or the life that you currently lead or how best to live that life. And the title, High as Hope, I think ultimately how I understand it, because I definitely felt like this record was a lot about you know, finding hope in the darkest of times, because, you know, we're going through some dark times right now, politically and socially. Um, and this title, I can't help but ignore it. I feel it's like about hope beyond hope. Um, and she does talk about hope several times in this record. And I think that ultimately this song is about the hope of continuing to love life. Um, and it's not always so much about finding that in other people. It's about what's within and completing stories and narratives of your own familial history, your own life and surroundings that's not somewhere exotic, somewhere far away. It's all sitting around you for you to deal with and contemplate. A beautiful, soft-spoken record. Very different from her much more rambunctious, uh, wild ones. Um, and ultimately, I'm not entirely sure if it's my favorite record of hers. I mean, How Big, How Blue has a real special place in my heart. That record was just I was obsessed with that record for a good few months, like I'm gonna be completely honest. And Ceremonials also, it just did something to me. But this record is still very arresting and I definitely recommend it. And I definitely think it's a beautiful progression in her career. Each record is a little bit different and gives us a little bit of a different insight into her so songwriting and her life. I hope you enjoyed this review and please let me know in the comments your interpretations and what songs you love and don't love about this record. Um, be really interested to hear. And like I said, check out all of my other Florence reviews. They'll be all linked in the description below. I hope you all have a wonderful, blessed day. Peace, love, and light. Bye.